It's crazy. I don't think people ever really truly will know how much work goes into each and every event. But again, it all comes down to the right team. That's mm -hmm. the biggest secret. Your life should be about giving back, whether it's, you know, it doesn't have to cost anything. It's smiling at a stranger, you know, making somebody's day better. That's free. And it makes the world a little bit better. That's free. Yeah, it's free. <laughs> and that's the truest source of happiness. I feel like one of the reasons you're such a happy person, <laughs> always delightful, yeah. is because you help so many people and you have this internal sense of gratitude all the time. You're not proving anything to anybody because you prove it to yourself and you're proving it that you're going to be there for these people for months consistently to come. Funny enough, when I was growing up, I wanted to be a rock star. I wanted to be Axl Rose. Axl Rose. <laughs> yeah, I'm big Guns N' Roses guy. So you want to be a rock star? <laughs> live long, big house, rock on. <laughs> exactly. Coming up in the world. Marcus trusts nobody. Got to look over your shoulder constantly. <laughs> <laughs> Got an incredible podcast for you guys today featuring one of the most selfless, humanitarian, love-filled humans I've ever met. Tune in, enjoy, take a screenshot of however you're listening and put it on your Instagram, Facebook story and it helps spread the word for the Mr. Atlanta podcast. Now enjoy. All right. Welcome to the 12th episode of the Mr. Atlanta podcast. David Roland Brown here. Thanks for coming on, Marcus. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Why don't you introduce yourself? So my name is Marcus Acosta. I'm the president of Hands Across Atlanta. So we go out every month and provide food, clothing, and hygiene for those in need, as well as giving a full dental reconstructive makeover to one veteran every month. And we go and give supplies and resources to children living in underprivileged areas. So that's basically the three branches of our charity. Wow. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's huge. How long has it been going on? We've been doing this for about six years now. Okay, how'd you get into it? So crazy enough, me and a couple of friends went out and uh, actually started with one friend and we went out with about 25 sandwiches, just walked around the street, had no idea where we were going. And now six years later, crazy enough, thanks to the volunteers and their time and persistence, we've fed over 10,000 people. Which Jeez. is pretty awesome. Yeah. That's it's a crazy. Lot of hungry people. But yeah, it started really small and uh, we've just had an incredible team. And so this happens in downtown Renaissance Park usually? So Renaissance Park ended up getting closed down, so now we're doing it over at Hurt Park. Okay. And word on the street is that they're about to close Hurt Park or at least add a fence around it. So Are you for real? Oh, yeah, it's crazy. So we've been going out there and feeding every single month for probably the last four years and now uh, and these, these people aren't doing anything I mean they're just sleeping at the park and now everybody's trying to kind of kick them out by uh, building a fence and locking it at night so I mean I think it's a waste of taxpayers money but, yeah but we could still go there for the events during the day right yeah during the day it'll still be open so I guess it'll be kind of like a probably 10 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night it so. won't be able to start earlier Mm -hmm. What time do you usually start? Usually we start about 1 o'clock, so the nice yeah. thing is that it won't probably be before that time, but I still, I just think it's, there's more humane ways to take care of these people, and I think the problem is, is that they're going to basically push these people out of sleeping at the park, so now they're going to be sleeping in your backyard. <laughs> I mean, it's, there's the, it, it's a... It's a very short-termed idea of how to solve this problem. They need to be thinking a little bit bigger and uh, more long-term. So what are some ideas of potential ways to solve this homelessness crisis that we have? Well, one of the biggest things would probably be building more shelters here. They just closed the shelter down at Pine Street. So, uh, yeah, and then for, there's Atlanta Mission. You can go over there. There's Mercy Care. There's Safe House. There's a lot of places that people can go, uh, but there's not a lot of Covenant permanent House. ones. Covenant also. House, yeah. Uh, but there's not a lot of permanent places. So I think, um, I mean, the biggest thing I think that they could do is help with the affordability of cost of living. Yeah. Because if, if we could make at least a certain side of area Atlanta uh, a little more affordable to live in, then we can actually solve the problem instead of just basically putting it in someone else's lap. And that's kind of what the city is doing right now. I can <laughs> empathize and relate with that. Absolutely. I mean, I've seen it firsthand. I moved into downtown. I think you know my story a little bit. Yeah. Um, in 2007, to go to Georgia State at 18. You were like right across the street from there. Right across the street from Woodruff Park, down the street from Hurt Park. And I, I know what it's like. And HUD, affordable housing, it has no real focus or 
priority with the city. Well, that's, that's true. I mean, it's, they're just not doing enough. And, uh, I mean, these are Atlanta citizens. Many of them worked for many years, and their tax money that they worked and put into should be helping them get back on their feet right now. Absolutely. And one of the things that scares me, I just watched, you know the show Rotten on Netflix? It's like a documentary. I, you know what, I, I haven't watched a lot of Netflix. So basically, they go through and break down different industries. A lot, the newest one is the avocado industry. And I love avocados, yeah. so I'm not going to say anything bad about them. Sure. Um, private prison systems is something that these people who are homeless or houseless are getting wrapped up into and never really getting out. Oh, yeah. I mean, these petty offenses and... Then missing an arraignment, getting a failure to appear, and the prison system's getting paid, the city, the state, the county, wherever that system is, by these private corporations. Oh yeah, I agree. It's, it's the same mentality of Blockbuster having the late fees. You know, they, they, they don't give people a chance to uh, fix their situation. They want to just have all these fees for, oh, you didn't make this, you didn't do this right, you didn't do this right. And they start to look at people as numbers instead of looking at them as people and there needs to be uh, a, a genuine uh, energy put into rehabilitating these people and getting them you know going to going to jail for a small petty offense it should be easier for you to get back into the workforce because if you get someone who's been in a low area bring them to a, a higher place of living they're less likely to cause crime they're less likely to steal and they're more likely to get back on the path but we need to make getting on the path easier and more efficient because it's not fair to purposely lean the cards against them and then wonder why they keep getting arrested. It's almost us, not they. Yeah, yeah, I'd say it's, it's, it's a, uh, we need to do a lot more to help them get back on their feet. Absolutely. I agree. So I like to focus on these kind of things that are hard to talk about. Let's talk about why you love Atlanta. Why I love Atlanta. What a great question. Why I love Atlanta. I mean, there's so many facets, uh, driving into the city at night and just seeing the skyline. I mean, I, I might be biased because I live here, but I think that we have uh, one of the most beautiful skylines to drive into. Um, and we have the largest aquarium, you know, I, I mean, I, I the Coca-Cola factory, but I think, really, I think it's the people that make Atlanta so awesome. The cool thing about it is Atlanta's a very big city. It's like one of the top cities now. It's almost becoming like the new Hollywood, but at the same time, it's very small and personal. Everybody kind of knows each other here. And, you know, I, I think uh, that's Or care to, or try to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Everybody tries to get to know each other. And I like that Atlanta's a little bit of a family, and we tend to care about our own. I see a lot of people, you know, when people fall or have something go wrong. I saw a girl got into a car accident last year, and everybody came together to help. And I think that's what's really cool about Atlanta. I think Atlanta really cares about its own. We really do. Yeah. We rep our own. Yes, sure. exactly. I think that's probably my favorite part, the heart of Atlanta. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm with it. So what are your personal, professional, and fitness goals? Personal, professional, and fitness goals. In any order you'd like to give. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I go work out about six days a week. Um, I, I Five to six days a week. Um, I hate that day off now that I'm so into it. It's like you never want to take that day off, but you need it. Um, I would say uh, just eating better. Uh, I mean, I think that's probably, if I have a real genuine goal, it'd be eating better, but um, I just, I love working out. And, and I, especially now that it's kind of bulk season, you know, I get to eat a little bit more, and then once we get kind of into the hotter months, kind of trim down, so I have more fun in the bulk season. Yeah, right. <laughs> get a little warm for winter. Yeah, exactly, get to eat a little bit more. I feel you, I've been doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah, it's like the nice thing about winter is you get to wear jackets and stuff, so, you know, now you can put on a little bit extra. Right. <laughs> have a couple of tacos. <laughs> okay, all right, so a little bit of personal and fitness goals. Yeah, absolutely. We run the nonprofit full time, mm -hmm. so, uh, so we have three branches. We have our veteran branch, our homeless branch, and our children's branch, and my job is basically to make sure the whole thing, uh, the, the whole building doesn't get caught on fire. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's nice. kind of, so uh, basically it's organizing the events, uh, keeping everything organized, and fundraising. Fundraising has kind of become one of the biggest aspects. Uh, you never realize how much a charity needs to make to keep going, and so that's kind of a big part of my job. I'm sure, yeah. yeah. 
So you get paid an overhead percentage, or I get paid I get paid salary uh, twice a month, and uh, so pretty cool. Our board of directors voted on my salary, and now it's basically my job, along with the board of directors and the fundraising team, to constantly make sure there's enough money in the account to cover all of our overhead expenses because you can get expensive running a charity and especially with three branches now it's like having three kids and each one you know wants new clothes on the first day of school <laughs> so it can get I'm expensive sure, yeah <laughs> how much overhead do y'all have to keep I, you know I would say we typically um, I think it's it's healthy to keep about five thousand to ten thousand in the account at all times I think that kind of covers you know, we've got a lot of things. We have to cover the transportation of all the veterans that we have through our organization. We have to cover all their uh, supply costs. We have to cover all the supply costs of the Feed the Homeless events, including the tables, the tents, the generators, everything included. Uh, the food costs, the clothing costs, and then for the children, uh, we have to get all of their school supplies. Uh, I don't know if you saw that video we did last month, but we spent about $2,000 on school supplies for uh, underprivileged kids. Yeah, I watched it. It was pretty I awesome. Watch them. <laughs> Thank you. I love it. It was really fun. <laughs> so it's 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 a lot of excitement. Um, it can be a little stressful sometimes, but at the same time, I like a challenge, and it's a little bit like uh, a different puzzle every month. And I'd rather be challenged by something that's complex uh, than constantly repeating the same thing. <laughs> I feel that. Yeah. So, what? is a recent obstacle that you've had and how did you overcome it? Recent obstacle? Well, you know what, this was our first year uh, setting up at Imagine Fest um, and that was probably one of the more uh, complex projects we've had because we had a 10 by 30 which was about the size of three tents and we had to get a whole bunch of different supplies to get it all set up. So yeah, we were setting up like a vendor booth uh, but we wanted to make ours really cool, so we had to get, um, we had this idea where being so hot, we were going to basically provide air conditioning for everybody. Well, the first two air conditioners we got didn't end up working. Uh, we ended up getting a large one, it didn't end up working, and we had to go back and forth to Home Depot like three or four times. And just buying all the supplies. While you know, the festivals yeah, well, getting it's, started. Yeah, well, it's getting started. And, uh, and, and it's so funny because I'm kind of like uh, joking like dad of the charity, you know, and, and so my mind is on the expenses, you know, and that's like I think you know, I always kind of jokingly uh, metaphor it as if I were the owner of a gas station, you know, it's like the, the person who owns it is the one who's the most like, oh, let's not spend too much here, spend too much here, and we had originally projected that this Imagine Fest would cost uh, like around five to six hundred and suddenly we're at like two thousand dollars buying supplies and uh, I mean it, it always goes higher than you think it's going to um, so that was a little bit of an obstacle but uh, we had an incredible team and the power of teamwork beat the whole thing and it was a total success so it was an obstacle but it ended in uh, success which was awesome okay how do you define that success well, I would say the black and white of it is I would say it's a success if we make a profit instead of losing money. So my goal was first and foremost to break even. If we break even, then at least we're not in the hole. We're not losing money. But to go uh, be here at this event. Exactly, exactly. Um, because it was it was such an incredible event, and they put so much time and effort into this, and uh, and I, we were just so honored to be part of it. Um, but when it started getting more and more expensive, it was like, oh, you know, are we going to be able to handle this? Are we going to be able to, you know, is this going to work out properly? And, uh, but we, again, we had a strong team and we made a profit. So, I mean, that was, we made a profit and we had a great time. I mean, How good of a profit? Um, we did pretty well. <laughs> I'll, say, I'll say we did pretty what well. What all were you selling? Um, so we were actually... Services provided. Yeah, so we were giving away, uh, we were selling water bottles, we were selling bracelets, um, really, well... Kids across Atlanta bracelets? We actually, you know what, we got all these really cool, uh, like bracelets like these, and, uh, and now the important thing was that we could not technically sell them, 
Um, With donations? Yep, yeah, so people were donating and then we would donate this. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like a gift. Right. Um, but we'd give like a gift of an ice cold water bottle or a bracelet um, and the air conditioning itself. I mean, a lot of people were coming and donating just to come and step out of the sun into air conditioning. Like so, yeah, we had, we had a little bit of thought process. Get people to pay for having, the community. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, you find some people that are really hot, you offer them air conditioning and they tend to be pretty receptive. <laughs> yeah, it was really hot. Yeah. Um, so, did y'all have a lot of signage, banners, yeah. blasting hands across Atlanta? And how many volunteers did y'all have? So, we had, uh, I had two hands across Atlanta team members with me. And then uh, Jules, who, uh, part of our hands across Atlanta team, uh, she had two of her friends come out. So, all of a sudden, there was five of us. And so, you know, we'd have certain people on the outside helping people come in. We'd have some people running the inside. I mean, it was, it really became, it went from just running a little vendor booth to almost becoming, you know, its own little event. And I think that's uh, a, a good way of describing ourselves in general. But that's becoming a little impressive. cog in the community. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And, uh, a necessary cog. Yes, exactly. You know, providing people water and air conditioning. Basic human services. You basic human services. And when you're up for four days straight, I mean, those things are necessary. <laughs> so who'd you coordinate it with to be at Imagine this year? Um, so we worked with a lot of uh, awesome people um, just kind of all through the ranks. I mean, we had different people running different areas and supervisors. And I mean, I can't... I, I don't want to, uh, I, I want the credit to go to everybody that was involved because there were so many different people involved. Okay. So um, Six Feathers was working, uh, they were really, really involved this year. I, I didn't, I, I didn't, um, I didn't get to see Scott and that was you one of my bummers. Yeah, I, I, I love Scott Depp and I, you know, we were all so busy the entire time that it was going on that uh, I, I think I went and saw Katie Womack and I was like, please give Scott a hug for me because, I mean, it was just... I, I can only imagine if we were that busy with this much, I can only imagine how busy Six Feathers was. I mean, they had like three different vendor booths, they had their own stage. I, uh, uh, God bless Scott's heart. I'm sure he was burning the candle at both ends. <laughs> and he has a good heart. Oh, he's got the best heart. We've done several fundraisers with him, and he is. He's, he's raised probably, I would say, over $3,000 this year for children. He's, he's a really good guy. Jesus. Yeah, yeah, really cool guy. Most recent event was at Tongue and Groove? Right? Yes, with Scott, yes. With Scott? Yes. Yep, yep. He does his, uh, his uh, fresh events, and they're awesome. I mean, he's got a great brand, and we've just been very happy to be working with him. Heck yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then an even more recent event we had was at Rocher Beauvoir. Yes. With Thomas Harpointer. Yes, the Bubbles Benefit. The Thomas bubbles Harpointer, benefit. big shout out to Thomas. Oh my gosh. When he's he... uh, the guest I had on two before you. Really? And said, you gotta have Marcus on. <laughs> well, I, I would say the same thing about Thomas. I mean, he put in so much time and effort and all the meetings, all the uh, publicity he put into it. I mean, I, I love working with... He's effective with... in his engagement. Yeah. For sure. I like working with uh, go-getters. I, I mean, anybody that's, I'm going to make it happen no matter what, uh, that tends to be my language. So I, I, I very much enjoy conversing with people like that. Mm. Mm, ditto, bro. <laughs> so how did we meet? How did we meet? I believe, if I remember correctly, you came to one of my events and we had gotten way too much clothing. If I remember correctly, we got way too much clothing. So we were actually at the park and then we had to get it all. We had, we had tons of bags. So we went over to, I'm trying to remember the right park. Uh, that was her park. We went over to her park. We gave away a majority of it. We started and then we went to Safe House. Yeah, we started at Renaissance. Then we went to Hurt Park. Then we went to Safe House, and we and delivered Woodruff the rest. Park. And then Woodruff Park. Yep, so we, uh... And no, I think it was Hurt, Woodruff, then Safe House. Safe House yeah. got the rest of everything we had. Yep, Safe House got all the ending. And, uh, and I remember you stayed with us till like, it was like 9.30. I mean, I, <laughs> I remember it was pitch black. And we 1 p.m. Uh, to 2 yeah, p.m. Yeah, it was, it was just like a whole day. Yeah, so that's when Stay ATL was kind of his heyday. It's prime. Yeah. And we... We're just trying to get active on Sundays in the community, give back. I had this team of people, and so I brought a f like two or three guys with me, um, like younger fraternity brothers, and then Mariah Spicer. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. She's the one who loved the Spicers. Her and Esther invited us out. Yeah. And so 
That's Lisa what I Lita, our, uh, haircutting brand. She's an amazing. She's still leader. doing it. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, she's doing. She, I think she's working at a different place now. Um, but she was just incredible. Great leader. Great leader. Absolutely. Great stylist. Yes. <laughs> um, but so, I remember going over there, and I had my truck, the Toyota Tacoma, and pulled it up onto the grass by the clothes. This was maybe like five, four or five p.m. when it's starting to. Slow down, and literally, it was a truck full of clothes. I mean, probably 800 items. Oh, yeah. A, a, a thousand? Least, yeah. A thousand more? I, I think, how many, how many bags was it? Do you remember? It was probably, I mean, gosh. This it's was, like 10 bags. Yeah, like it's a bags. big truck. A yeah. big bag. So, yeah, I, I, we were literally, like, making sure the people that we were giving it to were, like, appropriate to, and, you know, I'd give them the bags to take a little bit more, but, like, really spreading it. Yeah. And so it was nice because at these events, one of the things that can happen is we get a bunch of items, goods, things that people need, and it's distributed improperly. I've, I've just seen it so many times, like taking clothes to go sell, shoes, yeah. different stuff. Um, you know, like health services that, that we provide with hands, the dental, the hair, the, the showers, stuff like that is... You know, yeah, like it's, it's so thing. important. It's so necessary. The biggest thing is organization. Clean, you know, yeah, you can't beat that. No, that was one of the first things I, I noticed at y'all's events was those portable showers. Yeah, yeah, we had we've had a lot of awesome organizations work with us, and I mean the biggest thing is the more organized we can be when we show up, the more uh, these men and women tend to uh, to be organized. So if we just show up, you know, with a basket of clothing, then people are going to take and take and take. But if you have uh, more of an organized system and you show up, you know, and you say, hey, all right, guys, you know, everybody, please take one at a time. There's going to be plenty to come back for seconds. Let's just make sure everybody gets a fair and equal opportunity mm -hmm. to get at least one item. Um, people tend to be more receptive to that. You know, and I find if you don't present it as a rule, but you present it more as uh, an explanation of why it is, people tend to be a little bit more, uh, they, they digest it a little easier. And so, you know, it, people don't like rules. People don't like pushback. But if you just say, hey, look, I want to make sure everybody here gets fed, everybody here gets a jacket, and then once everybody's through, you know, please come back for seconds. I, I think people tend to be a little bit more comfortable with that mm -hmm. kind of a vibe. Real clear yeah. expectation. Exactly. Out. Exactly. By the man, it takes a... An orchestra. <laughs> it leader, does take an orchestra. A composer <laughs> to put that on. It, it, it does. I mean, it, there's a lot of hats that you have to wear in one day, and I mean, it's uh, it's crazy. I don't think people ever really truly will know how much work goes into each and every event. Um, but again, it all comes down to the right team. That's mm. the biggest secret. Absolutely. So you have a board. Yep. And how did that come about? So it's really awesome. I mean, we uh, you know, we we started. Six years ago, just as I consider us kids, you know, not having any idea of what we were doing, and every year uh, I like to think that we kind of evolved and got a little bit smarter and a little bit wiser and uh, a little more professional. So it was our second year that we started throwing around the idea of having a board, and then the third year where it stopped becoming a hobby and started to become its own organization. You know, we kind of got to that pivotal moment where we decided, okay, if we're going to keep doing this year three going forward, it can't just be a meetup group anymore. It's got to become something real. And so then it was like, okay, well, what are the steps? How do we become a real nonprofit? And back then, I mean, you know, uh, since, I, since it's an interview, I'll be honest, you know, we were nervous. I mean, it was, uh, I'd never built an organization, like a real organization before, and I had no idea. I mean, it was very daunting. But at the same time, we had a lot of incredible people motivating us and, and believing in us. And, uh, and so, you know, we, uh, my mom... Like who? Give some specifics. Whew, my mom. My mom, and my, my mom and my best friend, Drew, and my grandmother are probably my three, um, how would I say, my three top advisors of the world. You know, I mean, uh, truly, I, I, uh, whenever I have questions on how to handle something... I mean, I'm old-fashioned. I go to my mom, I go to my grandmother, I go to my best friend, because I know they're going to give me a very honest answer. Um, and, and I like honesty. I don't want to be surrounded by yes people. Mm -hmm. I want to be surrounded by honest people, because then you get better results. Um, but so we started putting together the board, and, uh, 
and then I supplied for the 501c3 and thought it was going to be quickly and it ended up taking almost a year for the government to approve it. Uh, now looking back, I'm okay with that because it does filter a lot of nonprofits that do it for the wrong reasons. Um, I have a true belief that it, they make it difficult so that it filters out anybody who's not really there for the long haul. Because once you're there for six years, you're either in it or you're not in it. There's, as nicely as I can say, you can't really fake it for six years. It's, it's going to weed out the people who really want to see it succeed and the people who are in for a flash in the pan. And those people are going to get weeded out. So um, it was an incredible honor to be approved for the 501c3. I mean, it was one of the best days of my life getting that letter from the IRS and it said, uh, you are now an official nonprofit. And I couldn't believe it. I mean, it was, in many ways, it was the first thing in my own entire life that I had uh, completed successfully. You know, I mean, it was just like, okay, wow, this is amazing. And in so many ways, that was the very first step. Because now we were a real 501c3, it was time to build a good board, uh, build some great teams, and, uh, and now we've just been lucky. It's like football, you know, we're, we're trying to get a great offense and a great defense. And, um, and, and I kind of put that mentality into building our veteran team, our children's team, and our homeless team. You know, we have uh, different teams with different managers, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of pressure on each one of those managers to keep the team going. So it's like running three little football teams. It's exciting. <laughs> Feel like Mark Cuban. <laughs> Dude, okay, all right. That's a good reference. Yeah, he owns the Mavericks. That's pretty cool. Oh, I just, he was in the documentary I was talking about, about the private prison. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Unexplained. Um, he also is in a one with talking about the world's billionaires. Um, yeah. How it's increased from like 180 people 10 years ago to, I think there's 8,000 billionaires. Really? No, no, no. 2000. 2000. Yeah. And so it talks about like who they are, where they are, um, why it is like that. I'm glad. I mean, that's that's good. That they, I, I mean, I like that it's expanding. I like that more people are taking the chance to to get involved. Yeah. And then we have a few pioneers in that system that are going around getting the other billionaires to reclaim their wealth. Yeah. And to make a pledge to donate half of it at least. To charity and organizations, which is huge. It's helping do a lot of things, fund yeah. certain things. Um, I think it certainly gives you a third dimension, uh, like Bill Gates. I mean, I, I think that you know, I mean, he's he's great f for Microsoft, but really, what he's done for he's the better world, for the world. He's better for the world, exactly. I, which Microsoft yeah. is the world? I yeah, mean, it, it helped create the world. Yeah, I mean, they're they're both they're both great. But I but I, I definitely have a little more respect for people who. Uh, share their money um, with charitable causes. As a humanitarian. Yes, for exactly. Sure. I, th yeah. I think we, we have an obligation uh, to, to help the world in some way. True. Otherwise, you're just here to take. And I don't think anyone really uh, respects people that are here only to take. You know, your, your, your life should be about giving back, whether it's, you know, it doesn't have to cost anything. It's smiling at a stranger. You know, making somebody's day better. That's free. And it makes the world a little bit better. That's free. Yeah, it's free. <laughs> and that's the truest source of happiness. I feel like one of the reasons you're such a happy person, <laughs> always delightful, yeah. is because you help so many people and you have this internal sense of gratitude all the time. You're not proving anything to anybody because you prove it to yourself and you're well, doing this safe. bigger picture of, of proving it, that you're going to be there for these people for months consistently to come. Well, that's exactly it. I mean, it, it, if your life is, is in some way making the world better, I just believe, and maybe this is with bias because I run a charity, but I believe you do tend to be happier. I, I think if your life has some kind of a value, or, or, or if you're at least participating in some type of value, you do, you sleep better. I mean, I, I do. I think I mean, I, I have the same feelings as everybody else. I get my feelings hurt or, you know, I get lifted up. But at the end of the day, if I genuinely feel like I gave it my best uh, effort, that's the best we can do. And I do. I think, I think we've been lucky enough to help a lot of people. And I hope as we continue to grow, we can help a lot more. Absolutely. We will. So let's back up a little bit. Sure. And talk about your story growing up. 
Sure. You were reborn. Yeah. Where'd you go to elementary, middle, and high school? I want to know young. What were you Sure. Into? Yeah. So, uh, funny enough, I was in chorus. Uh, chorus was like one of my big things. You I can like. definitely see it. Yeah, I always loved to sing. And, uh, and funny enough, that would actually kind of take form in high school because we started a rock band and, uh, and in Alpharetta I was kind of known as the lead singer of this rock band and so uh, What was it called? Uh, we were Diamond's Rage and then I was part of Below Axis so we were Below? Below Axis, okay. yeah. <laughs> Back in my rock and roll Diamond times. Diamond Rage. Yeah, so we were uh, so I was the lead I had really long hair and uh, I was the lead singer of this rock and roll band and uh, but then funny enough I also was interested in Key Club which was such a not rock and roll thing, you know. I mean, a key club was kind of, uh, you know, about helping out the school and helping out, like, you know, doing things after school for. So I guess that's kind of where my my love of community began uh, was the key club. So um, key club, chorus, uh, those were pretty much the big clubs. I was in wrestling for a little bit, and um, and that was it. Pretty much, I mean, my whole. Funny enough, when I was growing up, I wanted to be a rock star. I wanted to be Axl Rose. Axl Rose. <laughs> yeah, I was a big Guns N' Roses. Hell yeah. Yeah, I was a big Guns N' Roses guy, so uh, that was... So you want to be a rock star? <laughs> live long, take out, rock on. <laughs> exactly. Coming up in the world. Marcus trust nobody. Got to look over your shoulder constantly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was, uh, it was you awesome. You probably don't know that Cypress Hill rap song. Because you're, and I understand and respect now more that you're rock, like that shit. Yeah. Uh, how you vibe, and I, I know you probably don't even cool. listen to that much music. Uh, do you listen to podcasts? What What do you listen to? You know, it, it's funny. Uh, it, it, I used to love listening to music, and this is probably going to lose all my followers, but I, I, as I get older, I find I like listening now to stuff that teaches you stuff. So, like, when I'm in the car, like, I, so, one of the best things I ever did was get YouTube Red. You know, it's like $10 a month. Bro, I've been paying for... So, you, what's the difference between YouTube Red and YouTube Premium? Well, I, I think they're the same thing. But pretty much it's so you can close it, so, you know, while of you're course. doing your stuff. So, now a lot of time I'll have, like, you know, um, how to give speeches, or how to, you know, how to do this, or how to do that, or, you know, how to write a contract, or, you know, it's like, I feel like that downtime in your car, a lot of people use that, they try to just fill that with uh, thoughtlessness. And I would rather take that time, that 30 minute commute to work, and learn something. You know, so I'm always trying to kind of learn stuff. So Fill it with thought full. Fill, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. There's no I, reason for you to not be completely engaged in what you're doing. Not only driving, but participating to external, passive audio. Exactly. And so I couldn't agree more that this consumption is so much more important, takes precedent over any kind of mood you're feeling with music. Silence, I've learned to get more close to in, in doing... Um, in parts of my drive, usually at the start, but I also just want to hit some bangers sometimes. Yeah. And listen to some tunes. Yeah. So it's usually when I'm running, um, I'm listening to music. That's what I was going to say. I listen to most of my music when I'm working out. Right. That's and kinda... that's just kind of that. Yeah. Um, but sometimes I'll be listening to information uh, through The Economist. It's one of my favorite publications. Yeah. Um, I have a subscription that I share with a friend. I also share my YouTube premium with, we have a family account. Oh good. With six people from X3 and so yeah. we all just, it's like three bucks a month or I think it's worth per it. person. It's uh, 16 for all of us. So Yeah, I mean that's it, you know, you're, I, I think the mind is like a rubber band and I think that the more you can kind of be stretching it out and filling it with stuff, you know, you're just gonna have a better mind. And I, uh, I mean, I, I love listening to music at the gym. And, and don't get me wrong, I mean, sometimes, you know, I leave a great event and it's like, oh, you know, I want to rock out. But I find now that I try my best to fill my driving time with informational, uh, you know, videos and audios and uh, podcasts and, you know, th th you have a little that... car. Um, phone holder. Yeah. Oh yeah. And so yeah. you put it in there and just let the YouTube. I just roll. Let, I let YouTube choose. Yeah, dude. And YouTube, I feel well. Of course, 
This is not a feeling, this is an objective statement. They know us. Yes. <laughs> they know what we like. Exactly. And if you put input into your account, so you go and you type, it is going to find these videos yes. that you really truly are into and can learn from, put you to new mental levels. So we'll have to exchange. I didn't know that you were such a YouTube guy. I could definitely yeah. see it and imagine it. Yeah, I mean, um, I, the biggest thing is, you know, I, I'll, I'll type in like, I will succeed motivation video or, you know, don't give up. And then, like you said, I'll just press play, put it on the Bluetooth, and then for my 30 minute drive, it just starts going, you know, the algorithm starts kind of choosing, okay, here's stuff about not giving up, being, you know, giving it 100%, you know, and, and especially if I'm going to a business meeting, I find, you know, and there's no right or wrong way. It's like eating a Reese's, you know, I mean, it's some people get amped up by listening to, you know, music or, you know, um, something that gives them pumped up. For me, I like to listen to stuff that's like, you know, um, more on how to have a good negotiation and how to have a fair negotiation. Because I think a lot of people, especially in business mode, get into a little bit of a cutthroat personality. And for me, I think that people, uh, that, that you have better business when you go in with the thought process of, I want everybody to win. If you have the thought process of, I want everyone to win, you get more consistency. And people, a lot of the time, have short-term thinking. They want a quick sale. But if you create a customer, if you create somebody who's going to be there consistently every year, it's much more successful. And I think people focus too much on a quick sale instead of building a family. Yeah, a big sale. Like, and, and coming with love, yes. I think, is one of the biggest things. If that's your intention and you make those intentions known, a way that you've done so well in these past six years. Love is kind of the, I would say, uh, love is kind of the base of the entire organization because first of all, it's all volunteers. So uh, the, the only logical reason why somebody would give up their time to help out is because they love people. Absolutely. So I mean, it's kind of the one thing is that everyone that we have working with Hands Across Atlanta come from different backgrounds, come from different cities, different states, but the one thing they all have in common is that they care about people. And that's, mm -hmm. so love is ultimately the foundation of our entire platform. That's pretty cool. When's the next event? So the next event is on Sunday, and it's from one o'clock to three o'clock. We're gonna meet at the Martin Luther King Center. It's gonna be a costume event. So we're doing a costume walk, where we're gonna meet at Martin Luther King Center. We're all gonna wear costumes. We're gonna walk to the done back. meeting at MLK? I'm sorry? Have y'all ever done an event at MLK? Oh yeah. oh yeah, oh yeah. Really? We've done probably, we've done probably about 13 or 14 events there. Wow. But yeah, and every year we do the same costume walk, where we go from MLK. Oh yeah, okay, park. okay, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. I haven't been, it's sorry. All, I know, it's all right, you and got a chance this weekend. <laughs> I'm definitely down. Yeah, it's so much fun. And then, this Sunday. Yes, yeah, this right. Sunday. Yep, and I, uh, I, I love any chance to wear costumes. So, uh, I mean, that's, that's always, from when I was a kid, I've loved wearing costumes and, you know, uh, this, to me is probably the most fun event of the year because mm -hmm. you know we I mean you you have a big group of Superman and Batman and you know all of them with bags of food just giving back to the community and having fun doing it and that I mean is the spirit of our entire organization having fun and giving back absolutely yeah um I've worked with that area a lot right the Edgewood area when I was running for office at Atlanta City Council yeah in District Five my area was right on the tip and so where district five is the most northwestern section um is downtown in the streets of edgewood which are amazing i love that part of atlanta i run a location page that i created about five years ago yeah um just because i was having so much business down there and it's a great area. and loved it and yeah it's great for so many reasons it's the only close bar district anywhere relative to downtown it's one of the most fun ones i have a ton of friends there and and we've been going since 2008 when i was a sophomore at georgia state 2008 that's crazy so, so you know, going to noni's or other places and drinking fuck it underage <laughs> and and having a blast and getting involved in the community. And so I've seen homelessness and oppression, depression, so many facets of, of it. And I think one of the most effective things is, is keeping account. Yes. Like, uh, Accountability, absolutely. And the nice uh, thing. An actual 
checklist of the names of the people who are houseless and writing down where they are, where they're living now. Yeah. And doing something like that. I helped this guy named Big Mouth Ben. Yeah, so yeah, he owns his own. Uh, yeah, he's awesome. He, we, in fact, crazy enough, we used to go and feed Big Mouth Ben when he lived under the bridge, right across the street. Now he owns his that own was gas six station. Years ago? Yeah, it's crazy. Was, that was. He was homeless six years ago. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I thought it was. It's wow. pretty recent. It's it's been a bay. I think he's had that store for about three years. Three years. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's all, amazing. He was speaking three years ago, like going yeah. to public events. And, oh yeah. And already sharing his testimony. Now it's just like blown up to this movement. Well, it's unbelievable. Is he gonna be there this weekend? Um, I hope so. That'd be yeah, wonderful. Yeah, i sure. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's just it's awesome that he like. You know, it went from living under this bridge to owning his own store, and now I mean, he's he's doing speeches. I mean, he, he's he wrote a book. I couldn't he be made more. Music. I couldn't be more impressed. He has a wife. He supports his yeah. entire community. Does he have kids? I, I'm not sure. I'm, not, I'm sure. not sure. But awesome guy. And, yeah, and I'm gonna have him and Tanya both on for sure. Oh, good. Yeah. I mean, he he is the most clear evidence that anybody can come back swinging. You know, and that's a lot of the time you just need that. Uh, optimism back in your heart and that's our job is to put that optimism back into people's hearts once that's there once you believe you can do it that's the hardest part everything else is I mean it, it almost just kind of comes by itself belief yeah is truly everything yeah I believe that and belief is perception yes I love that it's true I mean you know anything that you kind of imagine in your mind can come true and uh, you know, working with Thomas on the Bubbles Benefit was a great example of that. I mean, we uh, met for the first time about two months ago and uh, just had this idea, you know, oh, let's do this, let's do this here, let's see if we can, you know, get a lot of people. And uh, lo and behold, we sold out all the tickets, uh, I think, two days before the event, yeah. which is he had to release, crazy. He had to release, re-release tickets three times? Yeah, yeah. Three different times? Yeah. And it was packed. I mean, the first it was, year. It was all... Full. I mean, it, it was all all the way full, but it was like, you know, it was hard to move around at some point. Oh yeah, which is a good problem. But there was also the roof that it was a little too hot for us to utilize at that point, and so I mean, yeah, we don't really have a problem with needing more people there, raising more awareness about the event for that regard. Yeah. Um, but just our overall purpose and goals. Absolutely. Spreading that more would be great. I think that you know Thomas with AI's Media has done a great job with Bubbles Benefit Instagram and Facebook pages, posting and sharing content from it's marketing. Genius. Dylan York and Chucky Khan, who were photographing yes. the event, he asked me to come photograph Alpha, right? And, and I, I brought this camera and this <laughs> ring light. There, I love them too so much, and. Um, I was just like, I'm not taking pictures and video over them here because we also there are two other people doing it. So I was like five. I want to, and I'm definitely down um, at some points, but I also was having a blast. I yeah. was just like socializing myself with a whole bunch of people. I ran into, oh, a few guys that I haven't seen, and girls, for a long time. Um, a couple mentors, this guy named Jesse Altman that runs Why Not Okay, right? yeah. So, have you heard of that before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, it's a right? coffee, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, I got to hear the story of what happened with Why Not A and why it's no longer in existence and what he's doing now. And um, big transition, big moves. He's always been a big boss, baller, smart guy, doing it all the right things for the right reasons. What's the and, nice thing uh, is that I, I, I truly believe when you're going through life, the biggest product that you're really developing is yourself. Mm -hmm. And so if this falls through or this falls through, you're not that that's not your end goal the end goal is self so I think that if, if, if something falls apart or something else falls apart people who are determined are always going to be successful and if this one's not successful I mean what did uh, Edison failed a thousand times you know but he came up with uh, on the thousand of the ones he came out with the light bulb so you know I mean it, it's I think it's it's not important how many times you fall just how many times you get back up and jump back in absolutely and how you react to that situation, that yeah. circumstance, whatever. I feel like that's the true measure of a human. Exactly. Is how they react. Yes. And I feel like my sheer will and discipline, um, being in these circumstances, I've had this and that. I won't go deep into it now, but 
has been one of the biggest measures of myself and the reasons I feel like I do and that I have the capacity to make posts on Facebook saying 5% of cancer is genetics and 95% is what you eat like that because it's coming from so much love and sheer awareness that yeah sure it's not those numbers yeah. it's closer to probably 5 to 15% genetic um, 75% of what you eat and 10 to 20% of external factors maybe maybe more maybe 40% of just the air you breathe the water you drink uh, but really what you put in your body is I think the sheer biggest thing and what you don't put in your body is maybe even the biggest contributing factor. There's a, there's a lot of things that you can avoid that I've never really acknowledged. Yeah. And so, thanks for joining my TED talk. <laughs> hey, appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. I mean, I, I think the most important thing is that everybody be passionate about something. You know, I mean, I, that it's, and it's unfortunate that now we, we have such a, a, um, a critic generation growing in, in, in criticizing people's excitement and I think that that's a, a very mm -hmm. bad thing because people need to be excited about things and people need to be passionate about things and if someone's passion is not what you're into um, I think it's better to just shut up you know and let the person talk you know right. and, 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 and I, I hear you and I'm sorry to interrupt no. um, because I want to piggyback on the most recent post which was yesterday saying I, did, I wanted to do kind of a checkup of where I am in this holistic journey. Yeah. Nine months in, more mental clarity, physical energy, and overall happiness yeah. than I've ever had in my 31 years of life. And so my buddy Richard Corbett commented on that. And um, I just saw right before you got in your reply to him, which was beautiful. And <laughs> overall, I ended up thanking him for keeping me accountable and, and wanting to. You know, he said something like a little bit with harshness or brassness. And his comments, you know, calling me out saying I didn't do it. Um, not understanding that, yeah, I buy, um, I bought meat, seafood, for yeah. somebody else. And didn't make that explicit with what I was doing because I didn't really want to share that it was with somebody else. But you didn't, you didn't owe them any An explanation. explanation. For sure, but if I put it on the internet like yeah. that, I, yeah. I, I, you I feel like up. I kind of yeah. do. So, yeah. if... Well, you, can, you can choose how you want to react to it. I mean, that, and that's exactly it. And it's, and you do, you kind of want to um, respond to everybody, but it's, you know, I just, I think that uh, there's, there's too many critics and not enough heroes. And I think that that's the problem is that now it's so much easier to sit on your couch and judge what someone else is doing instead of being out there and doing it. And I'd rather there be more people out there trying to do anything and failing and getting back up and then failing again and developing something successful instead of just being on the couch eating Cheetos saying, oh, you loser, you... Oh, you Watching fail. Netflix yeah, on their uh, phone. You, you idiot, you fail. Trolling people. Yeah, right. it's like... We don't need that. Yeah. We got enough of that. Yeah. You know, Trump has helped make a, f a community, an ecosystem of that. So, yeah, you know, the division that we have in this country now and the polarities is, is worrisome. That's not put Trump into this. Sad. I don't, I don't want to put Trump into this. Of course not, yeah. but I'm just saying um, I feel like there's a lot of this or that now more than... Yeah. And so we got to focus on on the we and the whole picture. Yeah. So. Well, and the, and the biggest thing is it, we just have to basically be optimistic and happy because it's contagious. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I see people who... Um, Find the problems with the world that they're looking for. And so, you know, you have that one person who's posting racist articles every day. And it's like, oh, the, the world is racist. Here's what I found today. Here's what I... And it's like, yes, if every day you're looking for something, you're going to find it. If you go looking for trouble, you're going to find it. But if you go looking for happiness, you're also going to find it. And I think people should spend more time looking for stories on good instead of finding what's wrong with the world. Because, first of all, the news... Uh, sells more when they sell negativity. So it's going to be uh, 10 negative stories for every one positive story. And we have to choose which are we going to fill our lives with. I'd rather fill my life with the happy stories. You know, and yes, there are terrible things going on every day, but 
you, you have to be responsible for your own psychology and your own uh, mental health. And, and a big part of that is what are you filling your brain with? Are you filling it with negativity? What are you going to expect? You're going to, of course, you're going to become negative if you're looking at negativity every day. Just like you're going to become positive if you're looking at positivity every day. Mm -hmm. So I think the only thing we can really control is what we choose to inundate ourselves with. At the same time, I think it's just more important to focus on the good. And I think that's, it's just it's going to make you, do. yeah, it's all you can do. And, and I, and, and, uh, and, and hopefully people will, will become a little less judgy because it just, it's unfortunate that people's judgmentality um, hinders so much uh, growth because people are afraid to go out and take chances now. They're so worried, oh, people are going to laugh at me. And it's like, no, go out, take a giant chance. Don't worry about what people think because the people who are judging you are not pushing you forward and they're not investing you. That's my, that's my new biggest thing is if you're not investing in me, if you're not investing in my charity or my own success, then you don't really get a vote. And I think that's what people need to start understanding. You know what, if, if you've been with my charity for, you know, f four or five years and you're showing up to every event, then you have a say in, you know, hey, I'm not so crazy about this or hey, I wish we could do this differently. But if you've never shown up to one of my events and you're going to have the audacity to say something, it's like, I'm sorry, but you have not earned the right to have a vote in this discussion. Absolutely. And that's the most important thing. And people who show up uh, with criticism without showing up with an equal amount of uh, support, their opinion is valueless. Mm. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> so let's back back up a little sure. bit. Sure. And talk about what you were like in high school. What was I like in high school? Uh, you know, it's funny because in some ways I feel like I was so different back then because I was very uh, rebellious and, uh, and I mean, I wanted to be a rock star. So, you know, I mean, I, I, I didn't care about going to school. I didn't care about my grades. You know, I didn't care about learning. I, you know, I mean, I, it was just one of those live fast kind of lifestyles. And then I started to see the real life effects that that was having on my friends. Uh, and then I was, I was losing friends and, and it was, uh, you know, to drugs and to bad decisions, and uh, you know, s something kind of went off in my mind where I said, you know what, I don't really, if I'm going to be rebellious, I want to be productively rebellious. You know, rebel against things that I genuinely don't agree with, and do it in a professional manner. Because you know, just yelling and throwing bricks, it doesn't solve anything. But I have always believed that if you want to change things, it's best to change things from the inside. Get your foot in the door and change things in the big picture. You know, yelling and screaming doesn't get much done. I love that. <laughs> so, what are your political aspirations? My political aspirations? Uh, you know, I was thinking about getting involved in politics last year, uh, and I was getting very serious about running, um, and then things got a little bit too heated, and, I, and I, I started to feel like that wasn't the atmosphere I wanted to be in, you know, I, I wanted to get into politics um, simply because I thought maybe if I had the key to the city, then I could get more done. You know, because a lot of the time with the charity, it's kind of like us fighting, you know, without a lot of uh, help. And so I thought, you know, running for the city, maybe I could get a lot more done. But it just all started getting so nasty. And I kind of just decided, you know oh. what... Um, just with the discourse between, you know, the parties and, and just, you know, it, it, there used to be a time when you could have a disagreement with someone and you could leave afterwards and go get lunch, you know, and now both sides have become so polarized. And it happens from behind a keyboard. Yes. Yeah. And it's, and it's, it's so polarized that I just said, if I was to run as much as my heart would love to get involved with the solutions. I'm going to lose half of my friends. And, 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 and I can say honestly that neither side is worth losing. You know, and that's the thing. A lot of people have had this kind of belief of, oh, if you don't believe what I believe, then I don't even want you. And that's fine. You know, I'm not someone that uh, has the right to judge anyone else's thought process. But for myself, I'd rather be friends with everybody.
you know, and, and we can get a lot more done uh, having my Republican friends and my Democrat friends both working together uh, for a common mission. So, so I hear you, and I understand that that you definitely will lose, or not lose, but something will happen with half of your friends running most circumstances. Yeah. But there are other opportunities to run, like I did, as an independent. Yeah. In municipal elections, that's usually an option that's offered. And so I was able to do that. And I remember actually talking with you about political aspirations before I even announced that I was running for office. Yeah, I think we were, I think we were discussing that because we were both kind of putting our feet in the water uh, right at the same time. Council. Yeah, right. yeah. And, uh, I mean, it's, it, it, that was it's, not last year. That was in 2014 or 15. That 2015? Gosh. Yeah. It was a couple years ago. Because I started ago. brainstemming, like, I wanted to run for office in probably 15, early 15. Um, yeah. Just because I had got tired of seeing the egregious, the amount of terrible things happening and the inefficiencies. Uh, yeah. And I want to come with solutions like you and find ways to help as many people as possible. Well, that's the so. thing, and save some money while we do it. I mean, I, you know, I, I have my charity's frugalness just because, you know, uh, keep an eye on costs, and I think that we should have that same attitude towards the city. I, you know, I, I think we spend way too much money that could be saved by uh, working smarter instead of harder. Absolutely, and we spend it in the wrong ways. For yeah. instance, the snowpocalypse crisis when we had the city shut down for a week because we didn't have salt trucks or infrastructure to handle snow. This was what, back in 2008 and then yeah. another one in 2010. The city rented out, um, they had contractors come and we were paying six to 1600% over the normal prices for salt trucks and basic construction. Yeah, uh, pay for babies. <laughs> and it was literally, the most corrupt racket that the city's had in a long time. Um, there's been some other pretty heinous things. Um, and I'll digress, but those are things that I want to bring, shed some light on. And oh, absolutely. Awareness. Like, local municipal people and organizations within the government are way more effective getting to know them and involved with them than talking about Trump and yeah. you know even like state and, and national politics it's just you gotta start with the county and the city and and see what we can do there so well, in the future if it's uh, you know maybe we'll talk about it because I aspire at some point to get back in it they say once you see how the sausage is made you yeah. really want to eat it right so I also gave up meat <laughs> ago, but that was you know so I definitely want to make the the process of how it's created better. Absolutely. Um, and so many things, bringing transparency and efficiency, and love to it. And so we'll see. Um, Cory Booker's the only presidential candidate who is a vegan running, and um, he didn't really talk about it when he was in the city call. Um, the town that town hall es CNN did for. Climate change? Yeah. Um, I'm sure you didn't watch it because you don't waste time behind the TV. But I, I, I saw a couple of clips. <laughs> I saw some clips. Yeah, yeah, it was in the news a little bit. Yeah. And so, yeah, he didn't even really own it. And that's just because it's polarizing. Yeah. One percent of America is vegan. And, and like, probably 90% of America doesn't really like it. Yeah. And so, you know. Well, that's, and, you know, and it's the nature of the beast that their job right now is to win you know and that's probably a big problem with the system you know without getting too deep is that it's it should be uh more choreographed towards what it's actually accomplishing as opposed to just do what it takes to win right and stay winning yeah you know i understand it i it's like uh my grandfather once said when i was a kid you can argue with gravity all you want but try jumping off the roof <laughs> word so who are some of your mentors and how have they affected you and influenced you growing up? Wow, my mentors. Um, well, I would say, it's funny because in high school, 
uh, my mentors were like Jim Morrison, you know, and, and then as I've grown, uh, they've changed to be more like Steve Jobs and Richard Branson. I really like Richard Branson because um, he did it his way. Uh, you know, he started Virgin, uh, Virgin Airlines and Virgin Records. Um, but he always kind of kept a little bit of his rebellious uh, personality with him, you know, and, and kind of um, not trying to replicate somebody else's formula, but doing it his own way. And, uh, and that's kind of how I've always wanted to do, like Frank Sinatra said, you know, I did it my way. So I, I like that. Uh, I like Steve Jobs um, just because he was so meticulous with things. And I think he was, uh, you know, he believed in his vision. And I think a lot of the time you're going to have people telling you, that's a foolish idea, don't do that. And a lot of the time, if you can just believe in the process and ignore some of the don't do it, um, it's, I think it's better to fall on your knees and, and get that success than to just not try at all. Gotcha. So, so what I mean is mentors, what mentors in your life personally that you know oh, who have had man, influence over you and what has that done? How does it help you? I mean, I would say my biggest mentors, I would say, would be kind of my mom, my grandmother, grandma. and my best friend. Best. You know, and, and funny enough, my best friend's only about a year older than me, but just wise beyond his years. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and the cool thing about each one of them is that they all have a little bit of a different personality. And that's great because I don't want to bounce the same idea off the same person three times. I want to have three completely different uh, viewpoints and then I kind of put them together. So, um, you know, they, they all kind of three have different viewpoints. And hopefully they like it. When yeah. It's all put together. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Thanks for your piece of the cake, your piece. Yes, exactly. Now that it's a yes. whole. Exactly. That's exactly. Just put it in a blender and just drink it and make a milkshake. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I think if you can find people that are smarter than yourself, or maybe not smarter than yourself, but have the wisdom to make things tangible, and surround yourselves with them. I mean, I, I, I like to think that my advisors are smarter than me. If my advisors were not smarter than me, then I've got a problem. Facts. <laughs> so, Facts. you know, I mean, it, people put all this pressure on, on y you having to be so smart, but I think there's a lot more cleverness to just being surrounded by smart people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's, then you get the wisdom of the entire room that you can put towards a decision. Facts. And like, you know, I, I think I'd rather be wrong about something and it succeed you know so sometimes I'll say oh you know is this gonna work and then you know the team will say oh I think this is that this you know we did this we did this we did this and then I kind of look at it and I say okay you know what that sounds like a great idea let's run with it what's the worst that can happen and a lot of the time you know it, it's, it's it's a far greater success than you thought it was gonna be so the biggest question is what's the worst that can happen if you kind of ask that it, it kind of prevents you from uh, feeling the effects of fear there you go Ooh. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> snip it right there for the people. I'll go with that. I'll go with that. Okay. All right, well, let's uh, take a little break. Sure. All right. All right, we are back from break. So I want to dive into some Atlanta recommendations. All right. Where do you like to eat? Um, where do you like to buy your groceries? And then where do you like to eat out? All right, so I am a very efficient person. So I go to the Publix right outside my neighborhood mm. for no other reason other than location, location, location. Uh, as far as restaurants, what you know... What town is that? In Midtown? Midtown, yep. Right by uh, Ponce de Leon. Okay. And uh, you know what? I just moved to Ponce and I'm finding so many awesome places to eat. Uh, one that I got to bring up is uh, Hattie B's chicken. It is mm. unbelievable. And every day that I go over there, there's like a line out the door and... Uh, and I don't know why. That's like my the one place that really kind of catches my attention now through Midtown. I'll, sometimes I'll be driving by. Again, it's on my way. But I would uh, call that more Ponce Highlands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Ponce Highlands. Um, so that, and then uh, of or course, Ponce of the Highlands. Yeah, but that ain't Midtown no more. Yeah. Anything south of North. Yeah. Is, is uh, yeah, north of North generally it goes up to like what, Twenty Sixth Street, Midtown. Okay, yeah, so we, uh, then of course Chipotle and Moe's, I mean, those are my two, uh, those, that's where we probably eat the most out of all restaurants, Chipotle okay. and Moe's, I'm a burrito guy. Um, Sufficient. Yes, um, 
Man, what are some other good places? Uh, front page news. They have an incredible deviled egg appetizer. Mm. Strongly suggest. Mm. And now I'm kind of into uh, kind of like that Popeye's new chicken sandwich. <laughs> That's pretty good. But Chick Fil A is still gonna be. Yeah, you know what? I, I kind of like I like that on Sundays when Chick Fil A is closed. Open your store, Chick Fil A. Mm. Just kidding. Stay to yourself. <laughs> so where's some good places to go out and party? Good places to go and party. Well, my bias is of course going to come in because I, of course, am going to give first accolade to the places that have supported us, um, and we've been heavily supported by Tongue and Groove, Buckhead Saloon, Red Martini. So I'm probably going to say those three are my tops, only because um, it, it's one thing to operate a store, a restaurant, a bar. That's one thing, but to take that and try and help people with it, um, I think really impresses me. Mm. And it shows the heart of the owners. And, uh, and uh, the owners of all three of these establishments are just incredible people. The managers, the bartenders, uh, the servers, everyone involved. Um, yeah, I vibe with all three of those places. Those are also three yeah. of the most popping places in the city. Exactly, exactly. I, I agree. I, I think... Uh, I think I went to all three last week. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's... Um, I, I find Saloon is really cool because it's so close to my house now. So, you know, I'll go on the weekends. Um, Tongue and Groove. Uh, you know, I mean, there, there's a lot of amazing places. Havana Club is awesome. Um, let me see. Those are kind of my stomping grounds right now. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm one of those kind of people where uh, so much of going out to me is being around friends and seeing old friends. What other parts of town have you gone? Um, let me see. Like, there's like uh, I really like uh, District Republic. Um, let's see. Of course, Bleed Music Hall. Uh, they're awesome. They've got the huge screens. Uh, have you ever been? In, have you been in Bleed? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I I love the way they're set up, and uh, and I'm a big fan of Glenn Goodhand. So okay. Um, yeah, I would I would say those are probably my top uh, party spots. What local spots you got? You know what? I mean. I've just, because I'm still so new, uh, there's um, there, there's a strip of restaurants and bars right by my house, my little apartment. Um, you got La Fonda, you got El Bar. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Ponce. Yeah, ex exactly. A little bit further down, you have the Book House. Then you have the Masquerade, or you have MJQ, the Drunken yeah. Unicorn. I'm right. I'm right Friends, by like neighbors. Blind Willies and all that. So Blind Willies. Those those I like that little strip because I can walk there. And I'm uh, nine times out of ten, I make most of my decisions based on efficiency. So you know, it's if something is thirty minutes away and another one is ten minutes away, I'm probably going to go to the ten minutes away just based on uh, efficiency. Okay. <laughs> I'm a very efficient human being. So, what's some free activities you recommend in Atlanta? Ooh, man. Well, I would. I personally am a big bike rider. Uh, I, I used to love riding motorcycles, and I don't ride motorcycles as much. So now uh, I kind of get that same feeling from riding a bike. And uh, and I strongly suggest the Beltline um, and uh, and Piedmont Park, just because they're free. They're the meccas. Yeah, they're the meccas. I mean, the Beltline is all the distance you need. Uh, I would su suggest. Don't go on the weekends. People always think, oh, I'm going to go on Saturday and go Sunday. Go on the weekends, yeah. you know, especially if you haven't. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, in the in the prime of summer, yeah. it's very packed on the weekends. Yeah, it's going to be hard to be on a bike. If you're if you're walking, oh, it's on perfect. A bike. Yeah, of course. Yeah, if you're, if you're walking, it's great. Um, you know, on a skateboard, it's great. But on a bike, you're kind of stuck behind somebody. So I always try to say, if you don't want to be a tourist, go Monday through Friday. Saturday and Sunday are so fun though if you're going to go like on a date or if you want to go and feel the atmosphere because they'll have really cool stuff at Piedmont mm -hmm. Park. But oh, yeah. again, they're free, you know, and then, oh. you know, to get on your bike. They also have stuff in Old Fourth Ward Skate Park. Yeah. Pretty much every weekend all of summer, I'm sorry. No, you're right. <laughs> and um, I've been surprised because we do broga, boxing and yoga in Piedmont okay. Park every Saturday morning at 10 a.m. You're yeah. welcome to come. We're doing sure. it until December. Right on. And so the founder of Raw for a Cause, Matt Thomas, is um, a Lululemon certified yoga instructor. Awesome. Um, that recently happened. So to complete his certification, he needs 200 hours 
practicing with people. So we're just giving away free, amazing vinyasa yoga. That's awesome. And before that, we do an hour of shadow work and mitt work with boxing gloves and mitts, teaching people some self-defense. So Sweet. It's been one of my favorite little things to do. After that, I've become a crazy cross-country runner again since my heydays in high school. It's a beautiful so place to run. I, I find that I'm... I go on the belt line or yeah. in, the, in the park, yeah. and I'll do... Five to 15 miles, I did nine and a half on Sunday barefoot. In Piedmont Park, just in the grass, I'll go in circles. Can't really run barefoot on the belt line. I do run in my five fingers on the belt line and stay in the grass. Sure. Um, but yeah, you just see so many awesome events and things going on and people. Um, and if, you're, if you have the capacity to go into places that people are doing things, like the Atlanta belt line head main headquarters or Trees Atlanta, all right there by Crog Street Market. They uh, they have free stuff going on all the time. Yeah. And I just brought a few of my friends. It's an there. awesome got free spot. Food, free booze. Got to meet like twenty awesome people. So the whole thing is getting out there and doing it, and that's what Atlanta has to offer is is constant events. And, exactly. And like you're saying, the movers and shakers, the ones out there going out and trying to find it and learn it and get it, are the ones sharing it. And that's something I strive to do being a self-proclaimed man of Mr. Atlanta, you know? Yeah. It's like, the story is after, I've hosted 10,000 guests, parties between one and eight people on Airbnb, couchsurfing.org, and Stay ATL over the past 12 years, started with couchsurfing. And so, after like the 50th group of people were like, you know what, David? You kind of have the keys to the city. You're Mr. Atlanta. Yeah. So you know what? Heck yeah. I am Mr. Atlanta. I'm going to own that title. Sure. Nobody else is calling themselves that, so yeah. I might as well brand myself now exactly. and build myself now and hope I live to the title that I've proclaimed. And so that's one of the reasons I try to always stay active and out and accountable is, is this little moniker. Yeah. You know, and if I want to continue to be a man of the community and of the culture, then you got to get out there and be it. And, it's funny, a guy that I met at your event at Roche Beauvoir last week, uh, Just In Time DJ. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. I won two free passes to A3C Music Festival this weekend. Yes! <laughs> through him, because I competed in the, the, the competition. Yeah. yeah. And it's just like, fruition, well, it's... manifestation, making that thinking, speaking, saying, and praying it into existence. That's the way to make it happen. And also, just go out there and get it. Yeah. And then follow up. I'm a little annoying in my follow-up game. It's okay. That's right. You know what? I think entrepreneurs tend to be uh, extremely persistent, and it can drive normal people crazy. But at the same time, that's really kind of what separates them from being normal. So, you know, I mean, if I can say so, I don't think anybody should ever apologize for persistence um, because I do believe that, uh, you know, the greatest stories that we've ever heard have been about people being persistent and their persistence paying off. So I say, uh, knock on doors and don't apologize. Mm, big facts. Yeah. All right, so where do you get your news? Where do I get my news? All right, I'll go kind of deep on this one because I believe that there are two types of people. There are people who are genuinely focused on learning what is correct. And I think that these people tend to be a little bit more independent-minded um, and maybe not so sports team-minded. So I would say these kind of people typically find their news uh, from the source, uh, like Google, Snopes, you know, the, the actual where it happened. And that's probably the crowd that I tend to agree with more. And then on the other spectrum, you have uh, people who are very sports-minded. And, and, and not to dismiss sports, I love sports, but um, they, they, they are more focused on their team winning and their team's ideologies. And I don't tend to agree with that on either side because then when something happens that you disagree with, you're forced to side with it. And I don't think any independent-minded person should ever side with something they disagree with just to appease the population. And I think that happens uh, far too frequently. I hope I don't offend anybody, but 
Um, I would strongly suggest turn off CNN, turn off Fox News, turn off MSNBC. And Google it. And Google it. Because nine times out of ten you're going to realize that your side is uh, feeding you a little bit of garbage. And unfortunately, the way humans are made up, we, we tend to like preaching to our own choirs. So, you know, people like that validation of, oh, I knew that that was right. And then they find out the facts are a little more convoluted. So I, I would say if you want to get real news, stop watching the news. <laughs> Big facts. So, where are some places that you've traveled and that you want to travel? Oh, so that's a great question because uh, I, about five years ago, maybe six years ago, uh, my best friend and I went to Europe together and we backpacked all around. I mean, it was crazy. We got so sick, but uh, it was just the most incredible trip. We went to Germany, Ireland, Spain, Brussels, Amsterdam, Czech Republic, um, Germany, Paris, I mean it was just incredible. Uh, we ran with the Bulls in Spain which was I would say the best part of the entire trip. Uh, it was the most nerve-wracking part of the trip because I have really bad knees and I kept thinking oh I'm gonna blow my knees out and these Bulls are gonna run over me. Um, that was a trip uh, and we got videos. It of happens. It. it happens, yes. I've seen it happen. I ran with the Bulls. At oh the yeah. Train. Yeah, it's crazy. We, we were looking back and there were people laying on the ground and uh, I thought that European trip was incredible, and blood and bones. <laughs> and the Spanish are like, okay, let's just kill these bulls after. Yeah, which you know, I didn't really love when I lived in. Spain. I wasn't wild about that part, and uh, it's like a inhumane slaughter that a riot or are watching and cheering on, like in the yeah. Colosseum days. It's barbaric. It's bar I, I agree. I think it is barbaric. And, and that's one of the few things. We went through the run, but we did not go to the, uh, I, I don't know what they would officially call festival, it. Festival. The slime yeah, festival. The, the, yeah. yeah. When, when the matador actually goes into the arena, that's not something I was interested in. And, you know, being an American, I have to be very careful that I don't judge someone else's culture. But it's not my cup of tea. And, and, I, and I, I don't, I'm not really, uh, I'm not an advocate of, hurting animals. I mean, that's to me is, I, I would like to think that in 2019, I think a lot of us are on the same page. <laughs> Fact. So, I mean, it, it was fun seeing them run around and all that, um, but I, you know, I wish they'd let them just go and play afterwards. So where do you want to go? Uh, where do I want to go? That's a great question. Actually, probably the Orient. About that. I, I would say probably the Orient, um, the Orient or uh, Australia. I, I really want to see um, Asia or Australia, those are probably the two biggest places. That I'd South like to Korea go. changed my perspective on life. Yeah. I spent 10 weeks out there in college. Oh, awesome. And their efficiency, their love for their culture, yeah. their uh, how cheap and, and, and just practical it is. It's, it just works. They, they've been around for so long with so many people, density ratio is huge that it's do or die. Yeah, and they really, really love Americans in Korea. Um, where I was in in Iksan is ninety nine percent natives. So oh, the good. the one percent of anybody that's not born and raised there. Yeah, they're like honking their horns at you, and like buying you drinks when you're out, and and you know giving you suggestions and trying to talk with you. And it's and I learned a little bit of Korean enough to get by. Yeah, out there saying yes, no, hi, goodbye. And so it was pretty cool. My girlfriend at the time out there was relatively fluent. She oh, was doing awesome. teach and learn Korean. So I would absolutely recommend Asia. Um, Japan was pretty cool, super expensive. Um, I want to go to Thailand next, without a doubt. Oh, yeah. Um, I want to go to Bali more than anything. Oh, Bali sure. would be really cool, too. Um, well, I love South America. Yeah. I like traveling to South and Central America. I'm about to go on a cruise, dude. That's pretty exciting. Oh, that's so, awesome. New Year's. Cruises are fun. <laughs> I've never been. Really? I've never been on one. Oh, you're going to like it. I'm excited. Just, you like, get to be relaxed the whole time. You don't have to do that much traveling, which is nice. I like when I go somewhere to be just able to kick my feet up. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I like it. I also don't like the idea of being isolated on this, like, thing that I can't leave. But I'm going yeah. to, like, 40 of my family members in Louisiana. We've never done a trip like oh, this. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so you'll be surrounded by comfort. By, by love and yeah. comfort. And 
As long as I have a bar and a gym, I'm good. Those are the two necessities. You know, like, we'll, I'm gonna just go hit it hard in the daytime and probably work on my podcast a little bit, take pictures of my family, um, try to record the moment. I live in the moment so hard sure. all the time, but I love to capture it also. It's yeah. just one of the others. You relive 100% the this or 100% that. Right. right. So my family doesn't have a lot of people that do that, you know? Yeah. Um, and I'm excited to kind of come through with the camera. And whatnot, we're going to Mexico, um, Turks and Caicos, through Cancun. Caribbean. How long do you go to Mexico for? Um, it's a seven day trip. Okay, so perfect. Through celebrity cruises. Okay. Yeah, so I've never right on. heard of them before yeah, this, fun. and I'm excited. Yeah, I mean, those, those cruise ships, they, I mean, they just fill them with fun things. It's going to be, there's so much to do. It's like a little city moving through the water. It really is. So, what did Europe do for you? Uh, you know, I, I think the nice thing about traveling in general is that you tend to probably pick up on a little bit of more open-mindedness. Uh, you know, I, and I think that's necessary for anybody to kind of have at least some sense of how the world thinks as a whole. Um, and, uh, you know, but it also reminded me of how lucky we are. You know, I mean, there, there were a lot of places that didn't have electricity, you know, or, uh, you know, we, we'd be staying at hostels or, um, you know, Things where you, the, the Wi-Fi wouldn't be working as well, you know, and, or and at just all. yeah, or at all, you no know, hot water. Yeah, hot water. There's uh, obviously no ice. Like that doesn't exist. Either. Yeah, you know, it, it's. I think some people travel to Europe and then they get kind of an almost anti-American uh, tirade, and, and and I I I find that I loved Europe, and I thought it was such a beautiful and magnificent place, but there were also parts of me that were reminded of what's so incredible about America, you know, and then and, and the the up-to-dateness of where we are at. Right. True. So, I, you know, I... Um, it's I, the most amazing country in the world. Yeah. No doubt. Absolutely. Unprecedented. Yes. And the liberties that we have here, the basic human needs that we have here is, is second to none. And so it's nice to just hear stories and testaments like that of going out there and experiencing that to come back here and have a greater appreciation for the small things that we have. Absolutely. Well, I mean, and I, I've been able to experience it myself because to, to grow up uh, without a college education, without a father, you know, with a single mom household, to now run my own organization where I, I essentially work for myself you know, and, and not only that, but I get to help people for a living. Oh, you can only have that in America. You can only have that in life. Yeah, yeah. That's all we're really here for. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I, I do. I, I think America has given so much uh, of giving me the opportunity to turn my dream into a reality. And I think that's what will always be the most incredible part about America. Mm -hmm. Is that if, if you can dream it and you're willing to put the time and effort in, you will achieve it. And that's pretty awesome. That sounded good. So I want to give you something. Yeah. Um, here you go. All right. So take this. Okay. This is the most precious thing in the world. Okay. What are you going to do with it? You got to describe it for me first. Well, before that, I need it back. Okay. Now here's two more. Okay. What are you going to do with that? Uh, I need to know what they are. It's the most precious thing in the world. It's the most precious gift that can help humanity. Perfect. Well, then I'm going to keep it and I'm not going to let anybody else have it. Unless you want one, because it is yours. So I'm going to cut to the chase. You sure. killed it. That's maybe the <laughs> best it's ever been. Your posture stayed in the posture of giving and receiving the entire time. And it's really about the physical effect of what happens when you get this thing. Your natural reaction was to stay poised in a receiving posture because you didn't truly understand it. Sure. Once I explained it a little bit more, you still kept that posture, bro. And I have to say, <laughs> that's the best it's ever been. I've oh, I love it. 50 times. It was given to me. I took it and I said, I'm going to take this. I'm going to invest it. I'm going to manifest it. I'm going to protect it. And he said, no, 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 but I need it back. But here's some more and you didn't know it was coming because you closed your posture. Yes. So you stay in that receiving well, of giving and you're always going to receive and... Well, it's, the, it's, the, the, it's, the secret is 
is that you if you spend twenty dollars on yourself it's gonna make you happy for an hour but if you spend twenty dollars on someone else it makes you happy for the whole day so I think you know you can almost say that you're allowed to selfishly enjoy giving mm -hmm. and I wish more people would selfishly enjoy giving than try to in selfishly enjoy just keeping what they have right. you know what I mean it's kinda like when people say um, not trying to be selfish hoarding their stuff, but right. you don't have the yeah. vision or capacity yeah. or desire to... Yeah, but but allow yourself to enjoy giving to people. Because a lot of times people are like, oh, you're supposed to just give without any self-enjoyment. Like, it's supposed to be purely selfless. And it's like, that's a little silly. I think you, you can enjoy helping people. And it can be beneficial to both people, because I think every great business transaction occurs when both parties win. You know, and that kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about instead of just trying to get one sale or trying to get one transaction, try to turn that person into a long-term customer. And the way you do that is by making them feel equally uh, valued mm -hmm. and, and equally uh, like they got something. Yeah, and acknowledged. Exactly. And loved. Exactly. And loved. Exactly. Very well said. Hell yeah. Thank yeah. you, sir. <laughs> so, who are a few people that you would recommend for me to have on the podcast next? I would say, a few people that I recommend, uh, I would suggest Devin Wills because he has an incredible story. Um, he, he, he's got a story that's uh, in, in, in some way similar to mine um, a, as far as losing people. Um, but he also has such an optimism and tenacity that I think, uh, I think he'd be an incredible guest. Mm, absolutely. And then uh, my buddy Chris Mayer. Uh, he's just a really a go getter. Um, he's got an incredible uh, "I'm gonna make this happen" mentality, which is probably one of my favorite types of mentalities. Um, and and really has risen in the uh, construction business uh, tremendously. And it's just been fun to kind of watch him. So I would say those two um, would be my, I think, would be the most fascinating interviews. Okay. How about somebody within Hands Across Atlanta that could come on and explain it from a different point of view? Yeah, absolutely. Um, whew, it's tough because we have a big Hands Across Atlanta team now. So who was one of the ladies I met at Roche? Uh, red hair, I think? Is that maybe Jennifer? Jennifer? Yeah, she's awesome. She's the manager of our dental team. Okay. And uh, yeah, she's, you know what's so awesome about her is that she's actually a veteran. And our dental program helps veterans. So the cool thing about it is... Um, what I've tried to do with our managers is find people that genuinely have a, uh, a genuine compassion for their team. So like Jennifer, she is a veteran. And so with helping veterans, I think that her heart is going to be more focused on making sure that they're taken care of, mm -hmm. as opposed to just seeing them as numbers or the next person in line. She has a genuine compassion, and I think that's probably why she's so important in that role. Um, and, and, and equally, like uh, Jules is the manager of our uh, children's branch, and she has two young boys. So as you can see, I don't want someone who's just going to come into a position just to take that position, but I want someone who's genuinely in love with what they're in charge of. Mm. So um, Who wants to grow yeah, and evolve into that. Exactly. You know, I mean, the cool thing about it is I think every single person that's a part of the Hands Across Atlanta team uh, would have a different story to tell. Mm. And uh, I, 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 that's I, bold. Yeah, yeah. I'd be, I'd be uh, worried to know what they would say about me. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I, I, oh, well, now I'm excited. Yeah, yeah exactly. Ooh, let's yeah. roast Marcus. Yeah. We should do a roast. Yeah. Let's roast you. <laughs> When's your birthday? Uh, April 1st. April 1st? But, you know, I, I do think, uh, I, I really genuinely believe that I treat my team with. Uh, with love and and and, and so I, I try to too hard? no, <laughs> <laughs> but you know I I genuinely think that I, I am very fair with everybody you know and, and I am very meticulous you know and 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 I want things done a certain way but at the same time I would say that I genuinely believe everybody on my team would say that I'm fair mm -hmm. and, and that uh, I do expect a lot but I expect a lot from everybody equally. Uh, you know that it's not based on anything about your background, your gender, your culture, anything. I'm hard on everybody, and I think that uh, that the people who understand that give great results. And I think you know I 
I think the most I can ever do is be fair. You know, I, I don't want to be, um, I don't ever want to be too soft on them. I don't want to be too hard on them. Mm -hmm. I want to find kind of a healthy medium where I really try and get 100% or as close to 100% efficiency from the team. But I definitely think that I'm fair, and I think that's probably the most important thing, is I expect a lot from everybody. 80-20 is also good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I, you, you familiar with that? Getting eighty percent of it done and then having somebody else finish the twenty? I don't know. Tell me about that. Basically, getting the bulk of a project done, and then having another person come through and help execute the final part, which is usually the hardest part. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we we've had different variations on that. Like when we were doing Imagine, uh, we found that you know, I mean, bigger the biggest part of being the coach is putting people in the right places and finding the people that were the best at being outside the tent and, and bringing people in and then having the other people who were more of like uh, the, the people that were better at talking to people and you know trying to organize something so um, I, I think it's important to have everybody in the right place and that's that's what I think I'm learning as a leader is, is mm. giving people the right jobs you know if you give people the right jobs they're gonna excel if you put your shoe guy in charge of you know jackets there's gonna be confusion and that's that's the, I think the wisest thing you can do as a leader is is have everybody in the right spot absolutely and having that vision has got to be really hard oh yeah yeah that's the that's the most important thing because uh, you, you to be a captain of a ship you've got to know where you're going and you can have the greatest crew you can have the greatest ship but if you don't have a destination you're just gonna go around and around in circles and eventually you're going to run out of fuel so Thanks. you know it is you're, you're right I mean it, it's having the right team um, having the right vision and not giving up I mean I think those three if you just have those three almost everything else is kind of irrelevant mm -hmm. perseverance perseverance absolutely persistence is the number one tool in your toolbox oh baby <laughs> love it what keeps you up at night what keeps me up at night? Wow, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I like that. Um, what keeps me up at night? I would say that there is, um, especially as I grow, uh, becoming more confident in that everything's going to be okay. Because with an organization that is growing so fast, I mean, last year we've grown almost double where we were at the year before, which is wild. And what um, terms? As far as the amount of fundraisers we're having, the amount of money we're raising, uh, the kind of events we're having. Uh, like last year, we put two veterans through a program. This year, we put five veterans through a program. So we're trying to double, if not triple, uh, almost everything we're doing. And we've added a whole other branch, you know, the children's branch. If we're getting better and better every year, that shows that we're doing something right. And so a lot of it is just every year I feel a little more confident in the process. When we were first you know, starting out, I was like, I'm a little kid. I can't carry this whole thing. And now six years later, it's like, How you know what? I was about 23 when we first started. Okay. And now I'm 31. So I am a little bit of different of a man now than I was when we first began. Uh, I've definitely matured a lot. I, you know, I... I, I uh, I don't want to say, I jokingly say, I feel bad for anybody I worked with in the very beginning because I was much more of a boy back then. You know, I, I'd lose my temper, I, you know, I had, there, there were just, there was a lot of growing to do. And now, I like to believe I've become a little bit more of a mature man in the way I handle decisions. And part of it is just finding the good in everything and, and, and being so confident. Let me thank you. Sure. I agree, I hear you. How would you explain those decisions? How will you explain your decisions to your kids in the future? Whew. You know, it's, it's a very difficult question because I used to think that the things that had gone wrong in my life were disadvantages. And so growing up like without a dad and not having a lot of money in Alpharetta, which is a place of affluence, uh, I used to think that those were more disadvantages. And now, as I get older and I see what um, too much easiness has, uh, has weakened some people, that I'm, I'm really kind of glad that 
um, life kind of started getting me tough early on. Um, so, I, you know, in, in a funny way, I see a lot of the things that were disadvantages were now my greatest strengths. So I hope that I can convey to my kids that I know it looks like things are really tough, but the things that are tough now are actually making you stronger in the long run. And I would hope that they'd be confident. I hope they'd be um, happy. I, you know, I think, funny enough, we put so much emphasis on the other words, smart. You know, uh, you know the, the more I think about this, I think I would want them to be happy. Because I think we put so much emphasis on all the other things of wanting them to be smart, wanting them to be successful, wanting them to be, you know, uh, talented. And I hope that they are. And, and I mean, I genuinely think you get out of something what you put into it. So I imagine... I'm saying how would you explain your actions to them? Oh, you know what? I think they're going to understand. I, because I think I'm going to teach them, much like I teach my nephew, about management and, and, and big picture ideas. I think they're going to understand the uh, choices I've made. You know, I, I think, I mean, I've had to make difficult choices at different times. Uh, anyone running a business has to do that. And there are certainly uh, choices that I look back at and say, I could have done that better. Or I could have done that differently, but in the big picture, it's all part of the process, mm -hmm. you know. And, and um, I would say, where do you see yourself in twenty years? Where do I see myself in twenty years? That's a great question. I see myself. I see myself happy. I see myself happy in twenty years, and that is that is as specific as I can get. <laughs> That's it. A better version of myself. That's exactly it. If, if I'm doing things better in 20 years than I am now, I'll, be, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Kind of going in full stride, hitting it, aren't you? Yes, yes. Yeah. Ah, I can see it. It's a beautiful thing to witness. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. My pleasure. So, we have an event coming up Sunday. Sunday 1 p.m. 1 o'clock. Martin Luther King. Yep. And that's downtown Auburn Ave. Yep. Then when's the next Hurt Park or... So we go out every second Sunday of the month. So the next one will be, uh, let's Three check. Weeks. Yep, so let's, let's get a, a date. We have another event, November 10th. November so November 10th. 10th will be kind of our uh, Thanksgiving themed event and uh, that'll be a lot of fun and we'll probably have more of like a Thanksgiving um, uh, theme of foods. So right. we'll do like turkey, mashed potatoes, and all that. We'll set that all up at Hurt Park, we'll feed everybody, and then we'll do it again in December, and we'll kind of have our little Christmas themed event, and then we start in 2020, and hopefully we can bring it even more than we brought it this year. Mm. So, Any other fundraisers or special events going to happen between now and New Year's? You know, my goal right now, so the, the wild thing about having a charity of course, one of our biggest jobs is fundraising because we have to keep enough fuel to keep everything going. And right now is kind of an interesting time because October, November, and December are our three busiest months of the entire year. They're like our peak season. So my goal is, looking ahead, is that we gather as many nuts as we can now during October, November, and December because once January comes, a lot of people have spent so much money on the holidays People don't donate a lot in January. People kind of stay in the house. They've been traveling so much, and they tend to kind of get a little more reservist. Right. So my goal, again, as the coach, is to try and gather as much supplies as we can now. You have a to, warehouse, the stockpile, something along those lines? Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. well, the biggest thing that we're trying to do is collect funding, and so that's where we're trying to send as many fundraisers up as we can. So we just had the huge bubbles benefit, and now my goal is to have as many events as we can in the next three months. So, so we're going to have another fundraiser? Oh, we're going to hopefully have a fundraiser every week. Okay, I'll bet. <laughs> I okay. would imagine. I mean, the, the nice thing about the I'll holidays... I'll plug you in some places. Yeah, the nice thing about the holidays is, it, I mean, we literally start getting reached out to by every, you know, big night spot because a lot of them are wanting to throw something that's, you know, for helping people. And luckily, uh, humbly, we've become kind of the go-to mm. charity of a lot of the big places in Atlanta. And it's... It's been all. You work team. with Rhett at Republic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love Rhett. Good. Yeah. Um, love so Rhett, love Rhett, love all. Right. <laughs> okay. How about the Georgia Beer Garden or Joystick on Edgewood? They're owned by Johnny Martinez and Brandon, who 
are all about the community. It's near nearby where they live, close to home, so I'm sure they'll be yeah, interested I, in doing a fundraiser. That'd be amazing. I was just going to say that uh, Joypad, I, I believe that was one of my uh, first date spots in downtown. There you go. I went on a date one day. That's the place where there's all the arcades, right? Arcade yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, yep, yep. I, uh, I went there on a date one time. Uh, I had a really good time. I'm sure you did. <laughs> I think we brought a big old thing of quarters, and uh, I love those old arcade games. It's good. It's I'm, got I'm me kind of better. A, I'm a secret gamer. That's one of my hobbies. Okay. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's my number one go-to spot, like my local spot in Atlanta. Yeah. Like five of my friends from... Middle school work there. Really? And some more that I've met over years. And, and so it's a nice, nice little community in Edgewood. Um, let's see, where else? You should check out some Midtown spots, maybe like Flip Flops, Cuckoo Room, or Veranda. Um, they'd probably be open to doing something. Yeah. Then. Yeah, I mean, my, really, my goal at this point is to work with, I want to work with every big place in the city. You know, I mean, it's, it's uh, every year we've opened more and more doors. And I just genuinely believe that if we show up, you know, first there, last to leave, and we leave a good impression, then uh, it's always going to be consistent. I mean, awesome. now we work with Tongue and Groove probably once a month. We work with Bucket Saloon probably once a month. So, I mean, I think, Huge. yeah, I'd love to work with uh, Cuckoo Room. Um, I think we're working with um, Big Sky uh, in the end of October. So uh, I'm trying to, I mean, I'm, I'm one of those people where I want to be... Um, Working with everybody, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to be. I know some places are like specific to one or specific to another, and I'm like, no, I think there's plenty of time to work with everybody. Agreed. <laughs> cool. Well, yeah. I feel like this is a pretty good time to wrap it up. Perfect. Why don't you tell everybody where they can find you online? Absolutely. So you guys can find us on Facebook.com. You can type in Hands Across Atlanta, and then while you're typing that in, go ahead and type in Hands Across Atlanta newsletter. Join our newsletter so you can be updated on all of our awesome stuff that we do every single week and uh thank you so much david for having me on Absolutely. mr atlanta my pleasure my <laughs> thank friend. you yes um is a website too handsacrossatlanta.com yeah. www.handsacrossatlanta.org there we go all right guys thanks for tuning in so much absolutely <laughs> cheers my man. thank you wow what an amazing discussion with mr marcus acosta that guy is doing all the right things for all the right reasons. And I cannot wait to continue to see his development. Thank you all so much for tuning in. This was a long one, full with a lot of insightful information. And it was a lot of fun for me. I feel like I'm starting to get to a repetition where I have the capacity to interrupt my guest just to keep it on track with my standard set questions. And what I want to deliver to you guys. So please subscribe, leave a review, share it with your friends, take a screenshot and put it on your Instagram story for much the most effective way to get the word out. And let me know what you think. Love y'all. Bye bye.